G'day, welcome, Early Crow episode 24, T Papley uh, potentially joining us at the back half of our episode. Um, we, Pre-Rat and I, are going to um, give our take on what happened in round zero, look at the NRL, go back and uh, just dissect a little bit of the grouse racing that was on Saturday, very early start there at headquarters Flemington and, and another dodgy track served up by um, the world's best racing surface. We'll get to that later on, Pre-Ready. Um, football round zero. I'm tipping it. I think it was a really good way to start the year. Yeah, good. Hey, I didn't mind only four games. It meant that I basically watched all of them bar one. Um, I actually kind of liked the softer start to the season. Whether so you watched all four quarters, did you, on Saturday night? Put yourself yes, through I did. it. Yeah, yeah, I got through it. Yeah, just. I thought about. I messaged the old man to the old man's Storch Collingwood supporter, and I. Uh, I sorry, I rang him on Sunday. I said, "Oh, did you watch all the game?" And he goes, nah, I turned it off at halftime and went to bed. And don't worry, I was in that mindset too. I almost packed it in, but nah, stuck stuck fat. Watch the boys. We battle without a bit of Jeremy Howe down back, I think. I think he straightens us up a bit. But So you think Jeremy Howe is going to make a 10-goal difference, do you? No, I don't think he'll make a 10-goal difference, but I do think he straightens us up a little bit. But yeah, GWS are impressive. How good are their midfield? I thought they were like so good that you don't know if their backs are any good because they didn't need to be. Um, they were so strong. They were ferocious. They were fast. They moved the ball real quick. Yeah. Aggressively, confidence. Um, they were the most impressive side in round one by way, I think. Um, but I do think they had better conditions to like show how good they're going, and they had a side that tapped out, you know, midway through the third quarter. So, yep. assisted by you know a big a big yap man filling a filling space on the ground and offering very very little. Yeah. I mean. If you're going to hang shit on the people of Western Sydney and their actual facilities, and then you're going to you're going to bump into Shane Mumford, who probably what shits me the most about that was if he tried that sort of garbage against Big Mummy back in the day, Co- Coxie would be missing a couple of weeks with a hematoma to the thigh. Yeah, and Mumford would probably be missing two years. No, no, he would just got him in the ruck. I reckon, you reckon? Just, just, just <laughs> gone through him a few times, Big Mummy. Um, yeah, it would have dropped him once or twice. It would have been bottle on. But um Didn't he make GWS watchable in those early years, Big Mummy, when you just saw him V line and someone and going, I'm putting you into this earth and if you are gonna go get that ball, it's genuinely all over. Journeyman, Shane Mumford, started yeah. at the Cats. And um well coincidentally, because I think it's just gonna it's definitely a theme of my show for this week. He's a premiership player at the Swans. <laughs> um battled away with a with a bung up knee. Um, maybe 2012 I'm guessing must have been um, but yeah I mean the window's wide open and I can I can feel the premiership breeze upon my face the swans were dynamic they were they were consistent they surged they overrun potentially the best midfield in the comp they weren't suited by the slippery soapy conditions but they had contributors almost all across the park assisted by and thank you very much whilst you had that statue out there at western sydney that can't shut his mouth and can't get a kick you're also paying i think a little bit of of grundy's wage and uh, god bless you for that because it was so enjoyable to see a man of his quality and size operate at such a level at the scg in a swans jersey we were so much better with him in the guts and I can't wait for the for the year ahead and the years to come. He's so good. I'm surprised it took you. I think by the time I edit a few things out of this, it might be two minutes and 30 seconds to speak about the Swans. I thought it was going to be, welcome to the AFL Swans podcast. I'm your host, Jack Dickens, and I'm going to talk to you why uh, the Swans are right in the premiership window. Well, it's why we, we're happy to kick off without Paps because I don't want him throwing cold water on this. I mean... The only criticism I could have of uh, Big Broads is maybe just feed the lizard a bit more. Like if 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 a lizard runs past you, you have to feed the lizard, give the hands. Um, but apart from that, Jesus, it, Melbourne ended up having a pretty bad night. The only person who had a worse night on Thursday night was David King, who um, just wanted to hang his flag at quarter time and half time on um, Max Gorn having dominated Brody Grundy to that point of the game, according to David. 
and they'd flash up stats as he was talking and and they like they were confusing because it looked like if anything Brody was winning and as a Swans fan I was thinking he was probably winning to half time how did you see the battle to half time yeah as a I'm going to say semi neutral supporter now the Swans like I'm going to have to uh going to have to declare that I've definitely got a massive soft spot for him. There is no way in the world Gorm was doing better work than Grundy in the midfield, especially with that tactic of Grundy taking his space. It just it meant that Gorn couldn't do what he wanted whenever he wanted like he usually does. When the game was a little bit harder and there was obviously a, a little bit less composure, it kept Sydney in it and you could just see that they started to capitalise on being a little bit more composed earlier than Melbourne did, which then ended up showing the football that they can play, which is scary out of that midfield. And there's, there is no way on this earth, for as long as I'm not horizontal to the ground and six feet under, that Gorn was better than Grundy on for the first half on Thursday night, let alone the full game. I enjoyed Twitter where uh, Dermy, Dermy just like outfit Kingy and just like rolled back over it on the, you know, the Saturday morning or whenever, just to remind like... <laughs> Remind him of his horrible take, like, off the bat. Can you imagine, like, that's your job and your takes are that bad and you're going to get keep uh, unbelievable? Yeah. I thought it was, yeah. To straighten us up, Grundy, though, that, that was outrageous. He was the fourth worst disposal efficiency on the ground with 43.5% disposal efficiency. So your comment about feeding the lizard a bit more, he might have uh, might have needed to spray a few more handballs out, out sideways and, uh, and feed a few of the midfielders more. But I think... What you got to love if you're a Sydney Swans fan or a Sydney Swans player is that just that confidence that he's playing with. It looked like he hadn't missed a beat. It looked like he'd been rucking, no injuries. Like obviously he got injured at Collingwood. He just he looked back to his absolute best, and he's going to be a weapon for the Swans going forward. I think also he takes pressure off a lot of them, but particularly um, McLean. He had a yep. good game, and he was he was like competent, even better than in the ruck because I think he's walking into such a platform set by Brody. And, and like he'd taken the sting right out of Max. So, yeah. If he stays fit, Jesus, they look good. I thought our man, like, how proud of him were you at the start when perhaps just he set the tone kind of thing. He set the tone before the game, you know, he let him in off the street. Real leader stuff. He handed out a jersey to James Jordan. Um, you know, it was. He raised Dan Hanbury up on the walk in. That was great. I, I love seeing I was worried. that. I, when I saw that, I got a bit worried. Oh, no, I, I got excited. Walking, I, that's his sort of walk when he's like he's in he's in a game. Like when we're playing golf, he's on. Then he saw Hannah's, and I thought, hang on, just stay focused. Don't get distracted. Yeah. Um, I thought he started enormous. I thought his pressure was outstanding. Um, he's hurt. He he gets hurt by the slippery conditions. You know, yeah. to, from being as deadly in front of goal, but kick that real good goal early um, yeah i thought he had a huge huge start to the year a stack of super coach points too 120 um, of the best from paps it was it was basically a big night party for everyone who's been on the other crow yep no um, agreed when they fed the lizard the lizard just dominated um it didn't matter how slippery it was he still gets that ball to come back to him that high pace when he's bouncing it freak jazzy enormous great like contested pressure even when he doesn't get a possession he influences the outcome his goal was strong. Yeah, um, body off. Chatty Warner, like half quiet, half quiet. I like he was, he might have given us a bit of a bum steer with all the um, sprint training chat because it was an endurance work. It was cousins like his last quarter. Yeah, hundred percent. He had his own footy at the end. It was just like him and Brody running around. It was like there was uh, you watching under twelves, you know, with a good ruckman and a good midfielder yep. just carving up. Um, yeah, hundred percent. They yeah, weren't even was looking for their teammates. Late. Like looking for each other. Yeah, I thought it was enormous. Um, going to be an interesting year and a really interesting play, something a bit deeper for the Swans. Um, Lloyd to the wing, going to get a lot less touches, but if they get the ball rolling and he's got that next kick down the line, he could be really effective, I think. What? I think that game was a bit of a micro, micro something of like what football, what their football brand could be. Because it just yeah. wasn't fast enough and, and dry enough to do what they wanted to do. Yeah, I think on a dry deck and potentially a spacious ground, if they, I mean, if they're going to make it all the way to be the MCG in a granny ride, imagine how good he'd be running up and down the wing, disposing of the ball with a bit more space. Mm. Yeah, yeah, kind of like moving into more of a like a side bottom role. Yeah, and a proper good distributor. I agree. Do you catch much of the the rest of the footy for the weekend? 
Uh, I watched almost all the footy all weekend. Um, what did you make of the Carlton comeback against Brisbane? Exciting for the football season. Yeah. Concerned about the game and both the sides, to be honest. Like, what? Well, if Bris- there was sort of yarn, and then after Thursday night, you're like, well, Brisbane's probably the favourites to win the comp. And then, you know, brutal teams who win premierships, who look like they're going to win premierships, don't do that at home, round one. It's the fa- it's the way they flopped out of it, I reckon. It's the concerning part. Mm. They just didn't switch off, but just turned off that 3 5%, and those good sides, and, and I... I think Carlton might be a much better side this year. Those good shot sides will punish you if you, if you give them that little bit of a little bit of extra space and that little bit of extra percentage to go and get the ball and, and do what they want with it. I think there's a chance that Brisbane uh, potentially maybe downhill skiers a bit. When it's going where they want it to go, they they are very 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 good. Yeah, but um, yeah, I don't know. I really don't know what to make of them. You know, they were, they were, at one stage they're going to win by 10 goals and you're like, Phew, they are the real deal. Good luck, Carlton. Yeah. But they came back and they got it done. Um, they got seven of the best out of Kerno and Mackay as well. If, uh, if Mackay has improved um, and he's able to stay a bit more switched on, that could be a proper, proper dynamic duo. You may not see Kerno kick as many as he did last year. Did he win the Coleman last year? Yeah. Um, you may not see him kick as many last year, but it'll be a much better for the side if him and McKay are both firing. Um, and if they're kicking goals left, right and centre, that actually could be very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. I think Carlton have got all the right... It's a huge win for them because they're going to get a heap, heap of home games. And yeah. they're going to have away games at Marvel and things like that because they're a Victorian side. So it's a big edge for, for those Victorian clubs to play finals and to make finals and finish fourth instead of fifth and things like that. And... To knock off the Premiership, probably favourites or mm. near favourites at home round one or zero is an enormous start for Carlton. And then what do we do with the Richmond? If mm. I was Richmond, I would tank. And I think they should tank. And hasn't old D Hardwick really just jammed him in the Denil stuff? I mean, flipped all the draft picks out, got the, the moderate-sized premium guns in, yeah. abandoned the ship. They've got wiped like a dirty ass by the Suns. It was... Ugly from the start. I think they potentially ran into a footy side that doesn't know how to kill a team yet and sort of got blessed by that a little bit. They yeah, were, that game was like on their terms from the get-go. The girthy, robust, aggressive midfielder Raoul is um, in for a huge year if his body can sustain the relentless attack on the pill which he puts in. Like, he's scary. Oh, Nuts, and I think uh, if if what you're saying is right in the summation of Gold Coast not being able to kill a side and they've knocked off Richmond by 39 points, they also could throw some uh, they could throw some results up. I don't know if they're good enough to make the eight, depending on the teams that were there last year and if some of them improve or whatever. But they'll be right around the mark, and yeah, if they work out that killer instinct, which no doubt Dimmer will probably train and coach that into them, they again could also be a pretty scary side. Especially with blokes like Matt Rowe. Jesus, he mm. blokes. I liked cool. I liked Swallow and Sexton down back. That yeah. switch. They look like like they can read the ball, particularly Sexton. Like he yeah. could become quite deadly back there. There was a fella up front, M. Rosas. He's gonna he's gonna have some big, big days. He is like super quick, agile, clean. Um, I don't know how consistent he's going to be. He looks young, but sort of football you'd love to have in that team. I tell you, he looks very, very, very exciting. He's a 22 year old, so yeah, there you go. So like, yeah. he's got his next two years will be pretty good, particularly if they are competitive. If they can find those, like the Noah Andersons, and they've got those blokes that can deliver the ball in the forward line, they're either kicking it to King and he's taking the big clunk, so they've got that bloke running around at their feet. That is that is a very deadly, lethal combination. They've got, like, one of the scariest forward lines. Yeah. Like, Casbolt played. He's going to, like, <sighs> compete. And then there's that... Um, what a unit Casbolt is, by the way. The one that's been around forever. Lacocious. Lacocious. He'll yep. do a job. And they've got that big, thick boy King. Like, he's going to be very, very good. Mm. 
Yeah. I couldn't believe with Lukosius. I think he's the best kick in the AFL, just about the best kick in the AFL, and he was playing off half back. About five games into last year when they played him up forward, I was thinking to myself, what have they done here? And then he came out and I think he kicked five in, I want to say Tasmania, I might be wrong there, and then kicked his steady twos and threes and ones for the rest of the year, and but just presented a big target for him because he's got good hands too. And if he's watching. playing the centre-half forward role, like what, a, what another awesome kick you've got. People like Sexton and, and those delivering it out of the back line to him to, or to Anderson, who's kicking it to him, and then he's either kicking goals or kicking in the forward line. I, I think, think you're King right. kicked 40 last year, and they weren't very good. So yep. they've got a lot of upside. They're they a scary do. matchup for the Swans yeah, because they're, they're so the... tall. Mm. And they've got the coach to do it now, somebody who's been there and done it and turned a list like that around before. So it be interesting Gold Coast. But I think they were four good games to start the, uh, start the season off. Like, Do you want to go over Collingwood again? Or, I mean, you can if you want. I, I can't believe that you let me off so lightly before. Have they got another parade this week? Because no, they're going we back home? Should. Are they going to unfurl the flag? And yeah, talk, we'll do are that. they going to do another video about the premiership again? Probably. Yeah, I might, actually, that's what I might do this week. I might go to the movie, watch the uh, the Collingwood doco at the movies, then go straight to the G. That might be my Friday Arvo. The only thing they want on on Saturday night was a free kick count. They want it 20, 20 to 16, I which is it. like just absolutely fascinating. So they got they got destroyed in disposals. They got destroyed in every other aspect that's relevant to football, but somehow they're able to win the free kick count convincingly. And at one stage, it was thirteen to six. Uh, the Norm Smith medalist match shoved it like just cleanly in the back. Play. If anyone's out there listening and, and shares my passion for umpires and the like, I'd love to know the 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 free kick like plus a negative for each club. Last year. I've got it for you here, Dicko. So for the 2023, the best differentials for free kicks, St Kilda was number one with plus 77. Frio, number two, plus 74. Brisbane, number three, plus 60. Four, Melbourne, plus 46. And fifth was Collingwood with plus 43. And where was Sydney? Uh, Sydney was, the differential was negative seven. So it was St Kilda, Frio, Brisbane, Melbourne, Collingwood, Carlton, Essendon, all in the positive free kick count, and then everybody else was uh, was negative for the differentials. With the pies, like round zero, you, I think. How worried are you? We're or gonna, are you just I think you can. Over, well, this is what I was about to say. I think you can overreact round zero. Ask me the same question again round four if we put in another couple of dismal performances, and you will see toys out of cot. Uh, he won't ever leave leave the back wall, Swanee, but. The other paraphernalia might uh, might depart the uh, Pratt office, mate. What do you think about this Friday night's game, Dicko? Swans, Pies. Um, Optimistic? Very yeah, excited. Uh, nothing to lose, too. Like, it's an away game for us against the Premiers. So, yep. like, if we get beat, I don't really... doesn't really dent. Like, the breeze, when I've got my head in the open Premiership window, the breeze might just soften slightly. Yeah, but I still feel phenomenal about it. Yeah, Swans Swans a good MCG team. We play good footy there. It'd be interesting um, to see how how well you do play and and what the side looks like and what all those midfielders look like actually on an open open field as well. I actually think it'll. Uh, you're a fortress at home, but I do think the. Uh, no, the we're ex- not. We're like fifty fifty last really? year, last couple of years at home. We're not I didn't good know that. at home. We're a bad team at the SCG. Yeah, right. Well, I do think the MCG will suit you a little bit more with blokes like Gordon and Warner and those blokes who can run Juzzy. There's three mil total max predicted uh, Wednesday, Thursday. There's yep. nothing Friday. It's 26 degrees. Like should it be should pristine. Be absolutely perfect conditions for footy. Um, yeah, I am very, very excited. Any of the uh, of the eight teams that have played so far that you're happy to just completely write off? Richmond, gone. Mm-hmm. Um, Collingwood, they need a lift. I was wondering and if you're going to jab that one. One in backman there. coming in is not going to change like structurally what it was like. Oh, I think, it does. I think we off. got found out with those big blokes from GWS, I, I, and I think how does straighten us up? He's not a Jesse he, Hogan was very good, wasn't he? He was very good. Yeah, very very good. He's a big mm. boy, big big boy. Mm. But no, it'll be interesting. Good start to the footy season. Great start to the AFL. It's yeah. How good is it that it's back? Yeah. It's just 
something it's to watch. It's just so much better that, uh, that when my team's going good. Like, I was so happy on Friday. Yep. It's a happy Thursday night. It just makes me so happy and very grateful for um, both Collingwood and Melbourne handing over who will end up being the number one ruckman in the comp by the end of the year. Yeah. <laughs> For nothing. That's not a uh, that's not an understatement either. I can't believe Melbourne being Like, Eddie will be blown off about cola. He wants some reverse cola. He'll be like, I don't care if it costs 1.8 times as much to live in Paynton as it does to live in um, St Kilda. They've got Brody Grundy. They're winning again, so we need to ban them from trading again. <laughs> I, uh, I can't believe how little Melbourne gave up for Grundy. I, I, I like that the trade happened. Well, what about what you gave up for him? No, I agree what? there that it was a mistake to start with. Or I don't know if it was a mistake. His contract was quite large, rumoured. So I, I understand where the club went to get it off the books. We can't fit them all in. But yeah, that what was he? Pick 40 for Grundy from Sydney? I don't know. Good trading. Very good trading, regardless. Perhaps, mate, thank you for making some time to come on uh, your podcast, mate. It's uh, it's much appreciated. Thanks, mate. It's, um, unfortunately, the podcast comes second rate last night, but I'm um, sure next week will be uh, first first off the cap of the ranks. And um, Yeah, but uh, last night was good fun at Fred again, so it was nice. I've got one for you too. So when I when you messaged the, uh, mine and yours and Dicko's WhatsApp and you said, oh, fuck, sorry, boys, I forgot I've got Fred again tonight. I was on the phone to Dicko at the time. And I'm like, oh, mate, Paps can't do tonight. He's got Fred again. And he's like, who's Fred? I'm like, no, no, mate, he's got the DJ Fred again tonight. And he's like, but but who's Fred? Dicko, mate, come on. And like, <laughs> He's an ancient dinosaur. He's like two years older than me. He didn't know who Fred again was, which was good. But uh, I know you saw uh, Marlon Hofstad. Who was better, Fred again or Hofstad? Um, I've, I've seen a couple of um, DJs. I've seen Fred again. Uh, last year when he was in the Horton Pavilion, a bit more of a rave. Where this time was, I was in Kudos. Um, thanks to Makita, I was actually in a, a nice uh, suite uh, with Joel. And but it was actually nice because during the week I could sit down, enjoy it. Um, but yeah, Harlem, uh, Marlon Hofstadt was good, but it was a bit sort of an outside, um, outside sort of fet day festival thing. So um, I like yep. the real, da- real dark and dingy one. So the, I can Fred again was good last night, but. The first time I seen him, it was better because of that rave set up. Oh, well, mate, uh, maybe straighten us up a little bit. Swans last Thursday night, SCG, uh, good win by the boys. How was the uh, how was the night? How did you see the game? Yeah, it was good. It was a uh, big night for the footy club, 150 years of um, the South Melbourne and Sydney Swans footy club. It's obviously a club with rich history and goes all the way back to the 1800s, 1890s. Um, so it was yeah, it was good. We obviously did a special march. Um, it was really, really something different that the club's done, and yeah, I really liked it. All the fans got around it. Um, yeah, it was sort of pumped you up. It was a fair bit before the before the game, so um, yeah, it was a bit bit different, but I loved it. Uh, seen a couple of the old fellas that played there, um, obviously from recent times, Hannah's and Joey and Kieran Jack, and there at the end of the parade and Benny McGlynn. So it's good to see those boys. And then obviously the game was was great. We we um, Melbourne was hard fought for three quarters, and then we sort of ran over the top of them and um, kicked away in the last quarter. So it's good to get the first uh, win off the board and give some confidence for the boys this week against the Pies. Good to see when you saw Hannah's and the boys that you got a little bit airborne as well. It was uh, it was good to see you coming across on the TV with a big smile on your face, and the boys clearly loved it as well. The uh, the walk <laughs> did it just did it just signify what the club's about and and how far and how long they've been in the AFL like as a as a neutral supporter watching it, it was pretty cool to just see the amount of fans that were out there and then also to see some of those past plays and how much it actually means to a lot of people. Yeah, it is. I think uh, 1874, I think, the first started. I um, have to double-check that, but I'm pretty sure it's that. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's it was great. It was it was a good night. It was obviously at the end of the game we had a few few uh, drinks upstairs and got around and the families come up and the old players are actually... Um, one of the old old boys come up to me that used to play with my grandfather, both my grandfathers, Max and Jeff. So, um, yeah, they go back a while and it's good to see they're still around the club and that's what's so great about the culture. And um, if you played 50 years ago, uh, 10 years ago, five years ago, you're welcome back. How did uh, how did that make you feel seeing people that had played with your grandparents? That's that's pretty surreal stuff. Yeah, it's, um, obviously it's a bit different. 1960s, uh, Jeff and Max played. So his name was Craig Lambert. Um, he was a good little player, apparently. This is what Craig was saying anyway. And Max said he went all right. So, um, yeah, it's it's uh, 
it's very interesting. It takes you a fair while back, um, but yeah, it's good. Uh, awesome. And uh, it'd obviously be a miss from me if I think if we didn't speak about Grundy. How enormous was he in the ruck for you? And uh, is that is that nice to see somebody who obviously went through some injuries at Collingwood, but then uh, obviously was a little bit in and out of Melbourne side last year and not playing the role that he want. Does it give you a bit more of a pep in your step to see somebody go out and do it like that, which which fires the balls up a little bit? Yeah, it was uh, it was great. He's obviously a big big man. He's been great for us in the preseason, and to do it up against the best in the league, Max Gorn, um, he did really well and um, gave us first use. Um, was great around the ground, um, and yeah, he's going to be big for us this year. He's got to keep backing it up, and it's, it's a big task. But he's got Darcy Cameron this week, one of my good mates. So look forward to uh, him getting into him. Geez, Darcy played a pretty good game on uh, Saturday night. I know this isn't in the rundown, but uh, he had a pretty good game himself, old Darcy Cameron. Yeah, he did. It's good. I actually messaged him saying, "But I'm bookie, just uh, take it, take a back seat this week, though." So um, no, he's <laughs> one of me, one of me good mates. So uh, when I'm in the centre bounce, I'll be able to be a bit of tongue in cheek. Speaking of, I think it was three clearances for the night. I, I know you don't like to pump your tyres up too much, but you got to be pretty happy with your own performance on the weekend. Yeah, it was good. It got up 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 the ground a bit. Uh, missed a couple of goals. We got one on the board, and yeah, it's good. We we sort of. Spin the wheels a bit in the midfield now. I'll get about, yeah, I don't know, 20%, 30%. So it's good. Sometimes the uh, forward pocket can be a very lonely place down there sometimes. So that no, was nice to uh, get a few touches and hopefully do the same this week. <clears throat> do you think it's going to be a, a big advantage for the amount of people that you can currently put through your midfield? I know some sides, when they do have a lot of options to run through the midfield, they can get a little bit lost. But it seems like for you blokes that, that when people went in there, they, they were wanting to go as hard as they possibly could, knowing that there was somebody else to come and replace them if they were tired and the, and they just played a bit of a secondary role? Yeah, it's um, obviously a, a few teams do it, do the sort of play a, a midfield forward um, instead of those seven forwards. So you play the six and then you play um, eight midfielders, I suppose you say. Um, I, th- I think Bulldogs have done it well in their time. Um, a lot of teams do it. I think Brisbane do it well. Uh, Melbourne even, Melbourne do a bit a fair bit of it as well. So it's it does give you um, some good run in the in sort of back half of the games and um we've obviously got some like those forwards like Isaac Heaney's a great forward as well. So when he goes forward he's also dangerous. Um but yeah, it's good. Is uh will we still see a little bit of Isaac in the middle? Do you, do you think that role will change when potentially uh Parker and Mills and stuff come back? I don't know how much you can say, but he was he was electric for you in there. Yeah, he was big, wasn't he? It's was probably one of his best games as a midfielder, so I'm, I doubt they'll be kicking him out anytime soon. Um, he's such a big boy and moves so well for his size. Probably one of the best athletes in the league, in my opinion. So, um, yeah, I'd be sh- I'd be hard to kick him out now. Yeah, it's um, it's crazy when you got a player like that who can take that big overhead clump too. Like, what do you do with him? He's clearly such a dynamic midfielder, but he could also kick five five goals in your forward line, taking a few big clunks and, and winning game for you. So. Nice luxury yeah. to have, but no doubt, uh, no doubt, it does come with a little bit of uh, where do we play him type vibes. Yeah, exactly. The atmosphere at the SCG, perhaps it looked pretty electric on on Thursday night. Was it a uh, was it a sellout crowd in the end? I think they got. I think I looked up at the board late in the last. It was like forty thousand and fourteen or something or something like that. So it was good to see forty thousand there. I think they got similar numbers to the prelim final. It's um yeah, it's such a great venue to watch the game. Everyone's so close, sort of feels like they're on top of you a bit. Yeah, it's good to get the win for it. No, awesome, mate. And then the boys uh that are potentially gonna come back in, are they all progressing well? So Adams, Parker and Mills, are they uh I think I saw the club put out um some timelines on your website. Are they uh how are they going and uh and are they looking forward to getting back to it? <laughs> yeah, they're they're coming along nicely. It's obviously a bit frustrating for them and get me a bit hard when you're when you're on the sidelines and we've obviously got to win and it would have been hard missing round one. It's such a big game. and uh, But, yeah, they're progressing well and I uh, look forward to them getting back into the training and back into the team. Does that um, fulfil you with a bit more confidence, especially the way you played on Thursday night, first hit out? I know you've had a scratch match and then an actual pracky, but that's got to give um, people like you and, and obviously the boys that you play with it, another pep in their step, knowing that you do have three absolutely elite quality players to come back into your side. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting one. It's, it can be hard. It's obviously they're tight for spots. Uh, makes makes um, the competition for spots very hard, and like everyone wants to play well as well as win, but everyone wants to keep their spot on the side. So, makes us play better. Makes us play as a team. 
um, because you want the best for the team. And if we keep winning, it makes it hard for the other boys to come back in. So yeah, it's, it can be it can be a bit. I think every good team that would have happened to Collingwood last year is always a bit a team that goes really well. It's hard to change the team, and it's obviously hard to um, when someone does get dropped. It's obviously a hard luck story because it because they're going well. So, but it's only uh, early on in the season, so um, we've still got a few weeks before they come back. So we'll see what happens. On to this week's game, Friday night footy at the G, potentially ninety plus thousand. What's the um? What's the differences between when you walk out to an SCG? Obviously, an amazing atmosphere, and I've been there once for an event. Haven't seen a haven't seen a game live, but I was there for an event. And it is that it's that awesome, cool little little's the wrong word. Forty thousand people is still a lot, but that <clears throat> a lot more enclosed stadium where the fans feel closer. What's the difference between running out there and then running out to like the MCG, full of ninety thousand screaming Collingwood uh, fans with probably what, as you said the other week, ten thousand or so Swans fans? Are you pumped? Yeah, it's a uh, it's a different different uh, vibe and it's a very different sound. There can be a bit different. The uh, Swans fans they're sort of more of a posh sort of clap, and the the Pies fans are abusive and get into you and are very passionate. Although the Swans fans are passionate, but you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, it's great. I love I love playing at both grounds, but the MCG's the MCG, and that's a pinnacle really, and that's what you dream of playing playing on when you. Uh, a ten-year-old, twelve-year-old, and running out to ninety thousand fans, and uh, whether it's your your team or not, you you love the sound of it. The atmosphere is just you can't describe it, and you get chills sort of when you run out of booing. Um, and I look forward to that. <clears throat> I love that. Yeah, Dicko and I spoke uh, a little bit uh, in an earlier segment. I think we're we're pretty excited to see what the, what you boys are going to do on a bigger ground as well. We know the uh, SCG can be a bit contested, um, especially with how fit all you blokes look. I think it's going to be a I think it's going to be a cracking contest on Friday night. Do you see? Do you sense the same thing? I mean, you do have to play, as you said, the uh, the pinnacles at the G in September. Are you looking forward to having a hit out on the G? Yeah, it's, uh, I love playing the G. I think we suit the G. We sort of move the ball pretty well. It's pretty well known in the AFL. We're, we're up there with ball movement stats and things like that. <clears throat> um, but yeah, Collingwood. Uh, I think they play real like the scoreboard probably didn't show. Um, what they did last week, they actually won a lot of stats and things like that. We, t- we touched on that today. and um, Yeah, I think it's going to be a great game. It's, uh, I'm sure it'll be very attacking, and but I saw also defensive. Uh, both teams really want to defend well, and then you attack off that. So I look forward to it. It's going to be a great atmosphere, Friday night footy. Um, I'm sure there would be many goals in between us, so look forward to it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well. should be a good game. How do you, what's the difference for you? How do you go preparing for a home game? You know, you wake up in your own bed and, and you do all your regular things as compared to an away game. Is there much of a difference for you? Do you stick to a... Do you have any routine when you're travelling to stay? Yeah, I I'm pretty old school. I sort of... Uh, I love the away trip. It's uh, good to get away with the boys um, for a night or so. Um, as well, the uh, missus probably isn't too happy, but um, <laughs> if she, I, uh, you get a nice bed at the... Uh, <laughs> nice bed at the... Um, Probably better not say where we where we stay, um, yep. but a nice bed at the hotel we stay at in Melbourne. Um, it's a nice, really nice hotel. Uh, go for a nice coffee in the morning, sleep on your own, and it's nice to sleep on your own every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, mate. I love that. Should be a good game on Friday night. Um, I know you're a cricket tragic like I am. How good was that win in uh, New Zealand? <laughs> oh, mate, it was elite. It's, um the uh, the boys always uh, stand up when they have to. I think the uh, the boys. I think Cam Green did it a couple of tests ago, um, and then Carey uh, this test. And they're obviously some boys under pressure. Green obviously early on, and now Carey. So it's good to see him um, sort of shut the critics up. Always like when when blokes are backs against the wall and and make some runs. And um, now it's Smitty. He's sort of backs against the wall. I'm sure he'll uh, make some runs soon and and sh- and shut him up again. So. No, it was good. It was an unbelievable win. Probably one of the better wins um, over there. I was assuming against New Zealand. It's tough to win. Pitch was yeah. doing a bit four, four for 30 and the boys dug in and got it done. So it was good after, I suppose, probably a disappointing series against West Indies and Pakistan. Um, early, even though they won against Pakistan, they probably would have liked to play a bit better. But uh, I think they yeah, clean sweep New Zealand and were pretty good. <clears throat> Speaking of backs against the wall, I've, I heard a stat. I was listening to the Grade Cricket earlier this morning and they were saying that Pat Cummins, uh, in his second innings, is averaging like 34, and his yeah, batting average that. is like 18 or 17. That's that's pretty good going. I know that probably gets you a bit excited, another Sydney man as well. But, uh, yeah, how good's that going for the captain standing up exactly when he needs to? Yeah, I think that's the uh, that's the edge that the Aussies also have. Their tail enders are so good. 
and they win them, win them games. They dig in for the boys. Like I think Nathan Lyon even works hard on his batting. Just the little things, the one percenters that make a team better, <clears throat> is yep. what is what can win your games in the end. And I think it's one of them. Fair few games over the summer, and then obviously last week won him a game again. Yeah, it's probably um, no different to the AFL, and it's no disrespect to the blokes that are probably uh, towards the end half being picked in the side, but no doubt it puts a pep in your step when you see somebody who's either been picked on the interchange or has come in as a as a late in for someone, or there's unfortunately been an injury stand up. Like that's the stuff that that grows you as a team and a club, and it just shows. I mean if you watched any of the test documentary, it just shows like Mitch Marsh about what he was doing, all the things that he was doing before he actually got in the side. Like no doubt the boys seeing line work on that and then going to night watch and surviving being a night watchman and then hitting a few runs the next day. Like that has to put a massive pep in their step. Yeah. I actually think the, the, the bottom sort of, I suppose you could have bought them seven or eight players. <clears throat> yeah. Footy actually win you more games in the top four. Cause you need that depth in footy. You also need the depth in cricket. And um, that's why it's such a, Sports, a team sport's so good, you need every uh, member of your team playing their role when they need to be. Yeah, 100%. And then uh, I better mention it because Dicko will probably kill me if I didn't, but get a fix. Uh, summary from the weekend. I know it's obviously not the result you wanted, <clears> but um, <throat> we did see the hog out in full force before the race as well. What's the? Uh, is there any owner update from uh, from one about get a fix? The boy, he wanted, wanted, uh, his mind was off the job again and um, he had a, had the big hog out. Um, but in the stalls, and then you think you try to might even try to mount a, one of the trainers and kick the trainer, and yeah, it was, yeah, was right. uh, a bit a bit scary. So, um, and then he's gone out and obviously ran a very poor run up to his standards and what they were expecting. Um, but yeah, I think they're gonna gold him and bring him back for the spring, and hopefully, uh, maybe a three three year old Magic Millions or something like that uh, would be nice. Um, but so yeah, that's uh, done for the prep now, is it? <clears throat> yeah, done for the prep. Come back late July. Yep. That's the plan, and um, early spring races, and then aim for the three-year-old Magic Millions. Oh, that's the target, but um, see how we go. Fingers crossed. Well, I know you're uh, I know you're a busy man. I know you're flying to Melbourne tonight, mate, so thanks for making some time uh, time for us. As I said on your podcast, it's good for you to uh, hold up the Paps part of the Paps and Dicko show. <laughs> but, uh, mate, good luck for Friday night, um, and, uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the show with uh, myself and Dicko. Uh, good luck for Friday, mate. Thanks, mate. Righto, let's uh, wrap up the AFL there. We'll just finish by just saying again how proud we are of the way Tom went about his footy on Thursday night. How grateful I am to the Swans as a whole for recruiting so well and providing the fans with such a phenomenal list to be excited about for the next year and year and a half, two years. And um, yeah, the window is open. I can feel the gentle breeze of a premiership upon my face. Pratty. Love it. Let's talk rugby league. It was a um, fast, big weekend of rugby league. The teams that played in Vegas didn't play. The Knights kicked it off against the Raiders. The Knights are almost favoured, I think, and um, they might be back to the Newcastle of old. Basically, since Joey retired, that is not very good. Um, Sticky's men, Ricky Sticky Stewart, the milk. They score with a man off. They they really, really put the cleanest through the Knights. I think the Knights are potentially in a fair bit of trouble. And super coach wise, uh Kalen Ponga stunk it up. A lot of players over the weekend stunk it up. Um but he was uh underwhelming. Mm. Shout out to Levy or Levi. Mm. The- uh the cheeky little hooker from uh the great man Raiders, scoring for did us. A phenomenal job for us. Yeah. yeah. God bless him. A hundred percent. He's good. Did you see the uh did you see the note that was in the locker room for Canberra? No. Just had a little picture. Sorry, what's the uh, what's the coach's name? It was on an A four or A four bit of paper, laminated, uh Canberra background. It either said and I can't remember exactly, it either said Fuck him, or we fucking hate him. One of the two was literally on an A4 bit of paper above somebody's locker all time. But so this is me first year NRL, and I've got a few things to bring to bring up for you later on, Dicko, that, that you Ricky might find in Ricky Stewart's like uh, as rugby league as it gets. He was a, a great. Well, he's a halfback. He was a very good halfback for the Raiders. He coached the Roosters to premierships. And now he's in um, Canberra. He's been there for ages. He loves 
meat and potato like Englishman who come over and do a job, and he loves. I think he loves. Us, he does like he loves a drink. I love but that. He, like he's the man. That, like he'll have real tantrums in the um, press conferences. He'll get in trouble this year for what he says post game at least twice. He's the guy that said, "I've known that kid. Since, I've known that bloke since he was a kid. He was a weak gutter dog then, and he's a weak gutter dog now." Yeah, that you get big vibes with that. That's the, I think that's what I love about what I've consumed so far in the NRL is just the just the way they say it. So they had um, is it Victor Radley who plays for oh, Big Victor? Yeah, he was on. Uh, I watched Victor the Inflictor. I watched Sunday Sunday night with Matty Johns, and he was on the uh, he was on the couch. Phenomenal and, TV. Ah, uh, it was just. The uh, the boysy boys that that was the four of them sitting on the couch was fucking all time viewing, and uh, and he said he thoroughly enjoyed himself in Vegas, like just, but in that way where he slipped into the sentence that like they they ran a little bit of a muck over there, which is great. But did you hear that? Uh, is it um, J W H? Jared Raria Hargraves, a oh. big hard man, a massive Adonis of a man, like thick. He's a big thick boy. So he played. New South Wales Cup on the weekend, and I saw some oh. highlights. It would be like me and you going and running against Shane Mumford. Like, they looked oh. fucking tiny around him. Do you want to know the biggest kicker of them all? Guess who snuck himself on the plane to Vegas while serving a seven game suspension? Oh, Jared was 100% go there. That's all time. Cannot believe that he somehow found his way, and apparently he ripped and teared because that's what they said on, the, uh, on Matty Johns' show. It was fucking great. He's a premiership player for the Roosters. He's been there a long time. He leads that pack. He'd be able to do like whatever he wants. He's He'd a fucking thick the unit, Roosters. though. I, I had a good giggle when I when I heard that he slipped his way over to Vegas. And so there's like things you can count on in rugby league. You can count on controversy. We got that. Yep. Wasn't the one we wanted, but we got it um, in Vegas. You can count on Ricky Sticky Stewart. He's going to get fined for something he says post match. Uh, Jared Rowia Hargraves will get sent off. The over under would be two point five this year, and no, it's probably four point five. See, so send offs like there was a bit of talk about that in the AFL. Like that's why you need them because they're grouse. Yeah, like it just adds to the 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 boringness of like the 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 long term of the game. Yeah, you know? I think Victor Radley was the most sent off player. Yeah, as well. Get, he gets sent. He loves a shoulder. Yeah. You can't. You used to be able to shoulder charge in rugby league. Yeah, he can't. And Victor. Victor's like more of a defender than a like a ball player. Yep. He'll run up to the line and, and, and feed the nut back, but he cuts bikes in half. He uh he scored the opening uh opening try in Vegas as well in that game, didn't he? Mm. I think I think Teddy fed him. Yeah. There was a fair few upsets in the NRL this week. Of the of the ones that that went under, the favourites that were supposed favourites going into it, are any of them that you're probably concerned about? Concerned about the the Dolphins? Yeah. Um, the Cowboys were very, very. They went. They were very good the year before. They were poor last year. They might be back, but y- you want to see him do it against a better side than the Dolphins. Speaking of the Cowboys, Dico, sorry to cut you off. Did you see Zach Laybutt's dummy that he sold to uh, one of the Dolphins defenders? It was like he gave that he, he sold candy to the baby, and the baby gave him cash. He then fucking took the cash and took the lollies back off the kid, so the kid's sitting there crying. I thought he threw it. I genuinely thought he threw it when I was watching it live. And candy I shop, baby. Couldn't believe how that he hung on to that. That was uh it was pretty dynamic. I think he scored two for the uh two for the Cowboys. But sorry, go on. Who else uh of the ones that were favourites that you're a little bit concerned about? The Titans, have they got a few problems? Well, Desi Desi Hasler's up there, it's his first game in charge. Um concerning. The Dragons are meant to be Awful. Hard. You wouldn't be betting on any of those teams moving forward until you get a bit more um, data. The Bulldogs were comprehensively dominated. The, but their effort was actually pretty good. But they looked impotent in attack, and that. But they barely got to get into attack. I guess. I thought the Parramatta Eels pack was fucking outstanding and just dominated, and they were rolling, and they were just. Truck and nut, like as good as you can ever see someone truck nut, or a footy club truck nut. They were outstanding. Um, I think Parramatta are in for a big year. Uh, and then the other game, uh, the Sharks were good enough to get out of jail against the Warriors. They were in trouble for yeah, the majority. Um, I think a few of the boys, including myself, in our NRL tipping, were on the Warriors. I actually checked that and thought that's nice. That's done. 
because um, I wasn't watching the full game. And same here, I thought, fucking hell, the Sharks, they've done me here. Yeah, I think I was watching the um, the footy or I was putting the kids down. On the, but, um, yeah, the Sharks got out of jail there. Nico Hines really struggled in Supercoach, which is concerning for us and a lot of people because he's highly owned. Yeah. Um, have to sort of see where he lands next week, but his break even is going to be enormous. Yeah. And um, I watched every minute of the Storm's glorious defeat of the Panthers. I think if I had to pick an NRL team to care about, it's probably the Storm. I was there when Brett Kamali led him with Glenn Lazarus to their uh, maiden premiership. They still have the that one or? At the Olympic Stadium, Mundine was playing. Um, maybe Jamie Ainsco just just tried to take a bloke's head off when he was trying to trying to catch a, a kick and got a penalty try. Very controversial. Look at Travis. Who would have thunk it? Very controversial win, but the, the Storm did it back. Anyway, they were enormous. Yeah. They were fierce. Penrith looked lost. They had plenty of opportunity. Um, you can't write off Penrith. That's not like... That's not like Collingwood having a slow start like Penrith have been the best side in the comp for five years so no I'm not being facetious ah, here we go you're not being facetious fucking spare me Penrith are a lot better at football than Collingwood are at AFL Fair that's enough. what I would say and they've got a bit of, better, bit of a better resume they had enough ball to put points on they didn't score a point it's either going to be Penrith are a bit wobbly yep which I doubt it's probably going to be that Melbourne are really good yep they did that without Munster yeah who's their best player. Um, so it's it, it looks like it's going to be a good year again for the Storm. Um, obviously, rugby league's a very long year, Paddy, and it's a brutal sport. So yeah. it's pretty much the better sides. It's about keeping your better players on the track as much as you can, particularly for like clubs like the Storm and the, the Panthers. They basically fund, with their stock, the origin sides. You know, Munster, Harry Grant, they'll play origin. That's their spine. The Panthers, all of them will play. Lots of them will play Origin. Do we... So yeah, basically, Sharks, Warriors, dot ball, uh, Newcastle in trouble. Full credit the milk. Um, the Storm look really good this year. Panthers, give them a give them a pass mark. Give them a forgive run. Parramatta Eels is probably the black booker of the week. They look fucking good, but the Bulldogs could just be very shit. Yeah, um, but their effort was good. Um, Dragons, Titans, no real idea. Sort of dot ball and a, and a and a pass mark for the Cowboys who kicked off with a big win over the Dolphins. Have we got our a... coach side was yeah was positive overall. Some of our big guns failed, but that was a pretty common thread with everyone. Yep, really. Um, the big boys did a job for us. Most of our cash cows did okay. I don't think there's anything to panic about. We've got to probably make a decision if we force a trade or not and I don't think we actually need to do we yeah I don't think we do I think everybody cop Nico Hines and uh, Nathan Cleary having down games like they're not people we have to worry about do we we just they're, they're set and forgets they say unless they show something in the next think... three or four weeks where they, they're not producing they're just if they go down in cash they go down in cash we're never going to trade them anyway so it doesn't overly well, matter yeah, you have to have one of them at least and yep. then I think you just want to I think we give them another go this week yeah you, you, you get 46 trades or something. Yep, right? 46 trades. But it kind of feels like a lot. Then all of a sudden, in August, you're almost out of trades. So Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of people that had the, the guy who's got eight weeks for being racist. Um, we dodged him. Yep. Jesse Arthurs went really good. Um, Salmon for the Bulldogs, the back rower, he's a low weight gutted dog. He got through a fair bit of work. If they go any good, I think he'll score points eventually. Um, yeah, I think we're in an okay position. Is there any uh, any trades that we want to make right now? Whilst Paps isn't on here, and there's no uh, there's no third person. I think we could look at trading um, for Feeder out. He hasn't been picked for the Dragons, and he's a cash cow. So we want those guys playing and earning us some money. Yeah. And Cartwright for the Knights is selected on the interchange. They're probably the only two. Yep. Do we need to potentially see if we can go one up, one down and getting Josh Kerr? Scored 76 on the weekend. It's only 349,000. I think the decision there is like, do you get rid of one of the halfbacks? I reckon it's a stay tuned. 
we'll chat with Paps and uh, and post any uh, post any decisions we make on the crow. If that's uh, NRL to go, should we uh, go over and have a look at uh, what happened at Flemington and at Randwick this weekend? Yeah, why not? A um, weird day's racing at Flemington with the early start and the um, the hot, hot, hot conditions. Yeah. Uh, God, it was a hot weekend in Melbourne town, wasn't it? Yeah, it was probably putrid. Um, overall, I think the talking points out of the meeting are Jamie Carr is airborne. We've been saying it for three or four or five weeks, um, but now everyone's aware of it. Full credit to our great ride cylinder. There are a couple of riders that really panicked and made poor decisions in the new market. The inside was not as good as the outside. There's a couple of blokes that went from the outside to the inside. Unbelievable sort of behaviour, really. Um, on pace and wide was the place to be down the straight, and on pace was the place to be on the circle and probably rails in run. So if you liked a horse that was off the fence, around the bends, and ran an okay race, you sort of foxy Cleopatra's in the last, and yeah, you're entitled to sort of stamp that horse and look to back at next start. Um, the mare Imperatrice. So you can have different levels of um, EIPH, which is what she had in the stewards' report. I would very confidently say, without knowing anything about her, that she had a the smallest possible EIPH that God's ever found in a stewards' report. A chance she because has... she's run a career PB. Yeah. They How have hard gone did they go up front? Nine point three lengths above the all average to the six hundred. Um, the winner. The race went 11.9 lengths above the all average. So I would more think that she's, yeah, like cooked. But it's kind of like, you know, you're saying Bolt, if he had to run the 100 at the Olympics and it was 40 degrees, yeah. he's a little bit more cooked than running the 100 in 25 degrees. Yeah. And he's run a PB yeah. in a 40 degree heat because the track's fast. I don't know, you know? Yeah. Like this is an elite athlete. Like as elite an athlete sprinting horse as we have in the country and she's done a PB yep she's probably going to pull up a bit sore so explain uh, what, what it means by going 9 under to the all average to the 600 for those at home who are who don't have access to the data that you do it's a a, a benchmark for every horse in Australia to, to run to the 600 to, to the 600 metre mark at a certain like speed and these horses went this race went 11.9 lengths faster than average. And this is a group one. Yep. So you can then put it into a class benchmark. So like for a group one race, they would normally have gone past the 600 meter mark, 3.4 lengths slower than they went on Saturday. Yeah, wow. Well, Yet they still came home. So they went 3.4 lengths faster than the class average to the 600. Yeah. And they came home 2.2 lengths faster than the class average. That's unbelievable. It's fucking unbelievable. Cylinders run a career PB by a significant margin. Like yep. Imperatrice had a big platform to, to do what she did. Um, the market sort of spat out the winner, and probably rightly so, given what he's done. Um, Autumn Angels probably the performance of the day yep um may ground when not many horses may ground um that race went 4.4 lengths above the all average to the 600 no 4.4 lengths above the class average to the 600 and she came home 3.8 lengths faster than the class average so she's gone enormous yeah and that was second up she's going to get further zara will stick she's in a great camp she's got a really good um, habit of, of line chasing and she's going to be ridden by the best rider in Australia outside of J-Mac so a lot of um, boxes ticked for an Autumn Angel she'll probably head to group ones in Sydney I think yeah and she's going to be extremely competitive in any race she, she'd have to be a sneaky you'd have to think about running in the Doncaster what do we do with uh in your opinion, Jay Carr, is her riding at the moment going to be baked into the price that they put up? Yes and no. Um, well, I don't. I don't back jockeys. I just have bigger bets if I find a horse that's ridden by a jockey I like. Yep. And I don't like all, not like jockeys. I like jockeys who are in in getting into form. Yep. So, um, if I find a horse she's on, I'm very happy to back it. 
Love it. And then what did you make of Amenimals run, mate? Obviously, I think we saw... Brave, good, first up, gelded, made at speed. Oh, I thought it was a pretty good performance. Beaten by a horse has run out of a skin um, and ridden really well. It was a great ride, Von Hall, yep. but sort of outside its normal pattern. Um, amenable in for a nice preparation. Second up, last prep, 2.2 lengths off Mr. Brightside. That form's very, 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 very good. Uh, he returns gelded, so he's going to improve. Um, he might head to the same sort of races. You know, he's a 1,600-meter, 2,000-meter horse who's returned in really good order, gone super, off uh, really nice trials. So, you know, I think when we're punting, Paddy, we've got to not so much look at the result of our bet, but look at the performance of the horse. And yep. it's a pretty good start for a preparation, what Amenable's done there on Saturday. You mentioned bright side. That's a fantastic segue into this weekend. The barrier draw's been done. We've got, Has it? Yep. Bright side jumping out of eleven, a dollar seventy five. Pride of Jenny out of six, three dollars fifty. Cascadian out of seven, thirteen dollars. Ayrton out of five, fifteens. Desert Lightning out of eight, seventeens. Buffalo River out of nine, twenty sixes, and longer the rest. Is it bright sides to lose? Hundred percent. What an incredibly disappointing race. Um Real big own goal to to change the setup from um, the voting. It's completely annihilated any exposure from the public and interest from the public. It's now just another race with a with a shitty field with a a horse that's very unlikely to be beaten. Um, I, I'm not knocking them for trying different things. I support most of the things they try and do. You know that. Yeah. Um, but this is a big, big error. This race is probably going to die, I reckon, off the back of this weekend. And it's sad because this state doesn't need these sort of races because it is the best premium product. Um, the turnover figures, if they ever showed you them, which they never will, would prove that. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we want to have innovation and and excitement in our industry yeah. and um i thought the voting and not from my own self-interest so if you're new to us or me like i got a horse into this race last year what i, what I would probably call pretty is the greatest ever value for money marketing campaign it race has ever seen with keith but i just think that that the voting and the marketing and the self urging and the content around it yep. made the race relevant in its own way. It made it into a people's race when the Everest is not a people's race. Yeah. It's a race for extremely wealthy people. Um I'm not clear on who pays what and who, you know, if they actually pay and they don't pay and I don't understand how it all works with the Everest, but you know, um, the bloke down the pub ain't, ain't part of that race. Yeah. Yep. Whereas if you vote in this race, you can be a chance of being a... a like, I met the guy who had Keats. You know, we went to an event last year. It was cool. He loved it. He was flown out by Racing Victoria from Newcastle, you know? That's cool. Um, it was... It was the race's only edge, really. Yeah. I think you're going to have years where you get shit fields for any race. Mm. But um, it's, it's so far below par. And I think that a lot of them and it's not racing Victoria's fault but they're petrified of Brightside mm. but particularly Brightside at Caulfield or Mooney Valley very hard to beat Caulfield would be his best track steering the punter back into something obviously potentially not as a single would you be happy with a dollar seventy five in a multi-league no. Caulfield it's hot Caulfield can be a very biased track. Yeah. I'd say it's the worst track to bet on of the three metros. Uh, without like data and knowing where you think what you think the bias might be. Yeah. There's probably gonna be a bias, it's probably gonna be Laney. Yeah. And prior to Jenny, if right, yep. he's a very good horse. Yeah. And a big advantage jumping from six potentially doesn't have to get across as many. Yeah, and, and she's trained by Kira Ma, who's yep. as good as anyone, probably better than most or all at getting these sort of horses to, to peak on days that matter. So um, I'd expect prior to Jenny runs near a career PB. Yep. She'd be favourite to get conditions that suit on Saturday. I think she beat Brightside or she beat one of them in the Champions Mile. 
Yeah, I can't remember which one, but she did. Yeah. Uh, so it's like she's she's in it. The race will thin out though. I think she's assisted. I'm just doing the form on the run here, guys, off the back of, off the top of my head. But I'd say, top of my head, she's going to be assisted by the fact that Celine Gordra is probably in the race, probably on Buffalo River, probably setting a nice tempo, which will suit Pride of Jenny. Because the only way that she could... The, the worst scenario for her is they go too slow and she's only two lengths off bright side at the 600 and he'll swallow her up. But if, if she's handlebars down and they're, they're, 200 to the, they're 400 to the 200, it's slower then they're six to the four, and then the last 100, they're all going extremely slow. That's how it'll win. Well, Buffalo River will go to the front and jump from nine. It's got to, uh, it's going to have to push the uh, the gas pedal yeah, to get Yeah, so there. it's in the race, is it? Yep, yeah, Buffalo Celine's riding? I um, don't know if Celine's on, um, but it is. It's it, drawn nine. Surely she'll be riding it. Yep. Yeah. It'll be a tragedy if they didn't give her the ride. Fair enough. Uh, looking ahead to the Golden Slipper, Dicko, going towards Sydney, um, Switzerland. What did you think of its run on the weekend? I thought it was a good win, nice horse, um, can't knock it. It's two from two or something like that. Um, I still have Storm Boy well in front of it, and I think the the market difference between those two is probably pretty accurate. Um, so that's that's a, Storm Boy 230 and Switzerland 450 currently. It's a big, thick boy, Storm Boy, and it's done a job repeatedly. It looked like a barrier trial to me when it won the other day. Um, I'd be confident in saying J Mac will be chasing Storm Boy, but they'll pick who they want. Um, it'll be interesting actually who they do go with. Um, James McDonald or Ryan Moore. Um, it's hard to see anything that's Switzerland beat beating it, although it had PR in a way um, on sat- Saturday. Um, but it's definitely advantage Storm Boy and. Um, It'll be interesting, the the Blue Diamond form. I think a few of them are going that way. Yeah. I also think Storm Boy's biggest edge, mate, is it's like tactical speed. So yeah, it doesn't matter if Storm Boy draws one or 17. There'll probably be 18 horses or 14 horses at least in the Golden Slipper. Mm-hmm. And if if he draws barrier one to barrier 17, it doesn't really matter. Whereas if Switzerland draws like barriers like two to one or three to one and is half slow, he's gone. Uh, if um, he draws sort of eight plus and he's got a few issues math wise, um, yeah. yeah. If I had a future ticket on Storm Boy at a big price, I'd be a very, very happy boy. The flying Adrian Bot, hey, he's the best at it. Like Adrian Bot and Gay Waterhouse are having one of the great two year old seasons of all time. Um, they just keep producing. You got, you got to have a lot of faith in them getting that horse to just improve and peak when he needs to. He didn't need to the other day. He looked big and gross and heavy and still put him away pretty comfortably. I think Storm Boy's a yeah, generational freak, potentially. And he's going to start favouring a golden slipper. You've got one with Adrian and Gay as well, don't you? 5% left. J-O-N-O. Jono at themailbag.com.au. A beautiful, gorgeous, athletic, yes, 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 cult. Uh, been to the breakers, big reports. Last share. If you want to get involved in race one with me, mailbag, bloodstock, I'd love to have you. You let me know. Or more importantly, probably better to let Jono know. And uh, yeah, we'll take you. Did you uh, did you view much else in uh, at Randwick on Saturday? What did you think think about its run? Ah, uh, good kickoffs. Probably all of them. Both yeah. his both his horses were all right kickoffs. I thought. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, we talk about it when we're talking sort of deeper stuff with our mailbag stuff, Pratty. You know, that's the sort of day and setups where you don't want to be having a sizable bet at a horse that's just kicking off. Um, I think they made the right call avoiding Imperatries with... Um, private Eye. With Private Eye. Um, he would have got his head kicked in in Melbourne, I reckon. Yep. Um, and, and he certainly had a much... A much better grounding for a for a grand final in Sydney than he would have had on that brutal tempo in the new market. They have gone like so so hard in the new market that um yeah I'd much rather be coming from the other race. Yep. And then just to round out on the horses, 
What about the head noise for Paps with uh, Tin Tuki saluting in the last one? He's added it as a bet the other week and then not butted up and it's saluted at 440 for him on the weekend. Yeah, rule number six, follow your money. Yeah. Yep. Uh, when you can. Righto, Pratty, team meeting, uh, early Crow FC, AFL super coach. Um, blessed this year to get a bit of a free roll around zero, getting a good look at a lot of premium options and some nice uh, potential cash cows. Yep. Um, overall uh, thoughts from you, super coach wise from round one, zero round zero. Yeah, so I think the the key is is that these scores count in the players three round average. So players that played well have already got a leg up on their break even. If we're looking at cash cows, all those that are a little bit lower that in price that we're looking to make some money out of, and then obviously the primos who have scored well, their price is likely to stay a little bit higher, um, and those that potentially didn't score as round. As well, round zero, not saying that they're not good players, but we can potentially look to target them as uh, as trading options in the future. Oh, Pretty, you, calm you obviously down. Watch... Whatever we do on the uh, Supercoach side is never an attack on a person's character or their ability as a footballer. Yep. It is just our preference for our own Supercoach side, which is a childish game that we like to play. 100%. So, um, feel free to offend um, anyone. If I take offence to something we say, we apologise. It was not our intent. Yep, love it. You've, have you been media trained before or...? No, I haven't. Ah, you picked up a few things, though. Mate, you would have watched, obviously, the Swans-Demons game we spoke about earlier with Paps, but fuck, what do we oh, do with you... a player like Isaac Heaney, mate? 26 um, touches, one goal, one, and 144 super coach points. He has gone big before previously in round ones or round zeros, but do we think he's going to start keep playing bulk midfield? Because that's somebody we probably have to potentially look at. I don't think he will because he's... I think he's the like probably the most dynamic one in there, and he can do a good job. He killed Cripps that night at the SCG, but he's so dynamic up forward. If he can kick straight, that's where he's going to be played. I think longer term, that's where I'll be playing him. I think that the Swans have, um, as we've spoken about, the window is wide open. <laughs> <sighs> I'm feeling the Premiership breeze on my cheeks again. Um, Mills is a midfielder slash potential defender not a forward um parker's parker will get sent up there i think for periods but he's not an isaac heaney level forward but he's a an elite midfielder and taylor adams you'd know more than i but yeah he's in the guts and the guts only be my read yeah um so when they come back that's got to squeeze isaac's minutes out and yeah i think makes him a bit of a risk super coach wise yeah, fair enough. That That's my... I think the Swans are so deep through the midfield this year. That's my concern with a few of their midfielders, like who does get squeezed out. Um, but yeah, fair enough. I think you're 100% right. he has got the ability to kick four to five goals in a single game and turn a game completely on its head. So. Well, maybe What's he priced at? He is currently a $483,000 forward. So that is the bonus with him. He can be slotted into the forward line. Let's keep that then on the, the just in, the, in our back pocket because yep. we'll 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 run through our side. Yep. We basically have two holes to fill in our midfield and one to fill in our forward line and about one point five mil. Yep. To do it with, I think and, from um, the Swans Demons game, the locks are Brody Grundy an absolute me. lock. Keep as that a up our sleeve. Had one hundred and thirty nine super coach points and twenty three touches, and. Didn't use the ball very well, which is scary to think how many he could score. Chad had... Surprising he scored so well, considering, you know, according to David King, he was getting killed for half the game, at least. So, it's <laughs> interesting. Well, he's almost had double the points of Max Gorn. Yeah. Yeah, he completely Jeez, bullied The super coach guys must have been watching a different game to Kingy, hey? 100%. Was it was a strange... Should we start in our back line? Strange. What's that? Should we start in our back line? Yep, sounds good. I think, so we've got Dacos, Sheasel and Young as the three main key premiums. primos. Dacos had a pretty good game against the Giants. What did he have? 34, kicked one goal, one and scored 131 super coach points. So I think he's a no-brainer to lock in our side. He looked he looked fresh. Um, he looks to be getting as much love as ever from the umpires, um, which is key. Um he looked nice and thirsty. He took tried to have a set shot from about sixty five out. Pulled it. Um, it's a bit of that going on. Mm, well, he, yeah, he looks in for another good year. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, she's all hoping he has... Obviously, he played very well last year, hoping he has <clears> a bit of a Dacos breakout year. Somebody that I'm willing to take a risk on. And then Young, with his midfield minutes, I think is a no-brainer. We have slotted in um, the rookie Howes from Melbourne. He had 91 on the weekend. Um but only 123k. He's somebody that we should be able to make some good money out of and, and get rid of him. Round eight, happy round enough nine. With Zach Zach Williams start. Yeah, that's one I wanted to chat to you about. I'm not sure. Did you watch much of the Carlton Brisbane game? Yep. What were your thoughts on him? Hard to read. Hard to know. I think that's probably his benchmark. You yeah. Know, like even like a Gibkiss and the Howes. From Melbourne, that that Melbourne game was a very unique set of conditions. That maybe that suits him to get touches. Yeah. And Gibkiss was getting pounded. The ball was there a lot. Maybe that helps him um, score. We'll find out, I guess. Um, yeah. Are there other cheapies that you want, or like is our potentials? I think if there's nothing that stands out to you, then we just roll with Zach on the bench. Yeah, not from what I've seen. I think. Uh... We can obviously bring him on for Zachary or Caulfield as well. If if seventy three is his his lower score, I think that's uh that's pretty good. At somebody who averages it was only two hundred and sixteen k and should make us some cash. He's got a break even of thirty nine, so Righto. he's doubled that. Righto, uh, Roycey. Uh, let's these are the Rolls Royces of the AFL. Let's head into the guts. Um, we've got two spots to fill. We're running with T Green from the Giants. Racked up one hundred and thirty two points. And when they destroyed the pies, absolutely wiped them. Uh, God, it's good to watch. Uh, Brayshaw from Frio. Uh, Chad Warner from the Swans, 118 points, one goal. Um, had his own footy there again in the last quarter against the, the Ds. Jack Steele from the Saints. Ollie Wines from the Power. And a um, couple of uh, cashies on the bench, including M. Roberts from the Swans, who uh, started his year off with 76 points. Yeah, looked like he, they pushed Lloyd up onto a wing and then he took a little bit of that role and was taking a kick in. So I think he's an absolute no-brainer as well at only 156,000, already scoring 76, so he's definitely a lock. Um, the Gold Coast game, do you see Matty Rao? Like, scary attack on the pill. Um, the grass-eating weapon from the Suns looks enormous. Yeah. Um. I think we have to roll with him. What price are we talking? Uh, Matty Rao, 517000 So yeah, under the six hundred, under the 600K mark. So you thought 600. I, I'm There we go. He's in. Yeah. You, you were very happy with how he went about it. Oh, how was him and Green? Like, they just they just almost have no regard for their body, hey? They just go and get the pill and facilitate. It's, it's awesome. He had a, if they're at a yearling parade, they parade like they're a bit like... They're going to handle that for a fair while, you'd think. They've got a couple of, I'd say, four or five seasons in them at that level. He had 20 clearances. 20. Mm. All right, Matt Rao in. Leaves us two spots to fill. One midfielder, one forward. We've got a million and 700. One mil, 700 left, P-Rat. Um, and what have we got to fill? We've got one mid spot? Yeah, and one forward. So if we look at a forward, and we, we're talking... Um, Let's go to the forwards first then, yeah? Yeah, sounds good. And then we can work out how much we've got to spend on a midfielder. Top prices, Jack McRae, Luke Jackson, Charlie Kernow, who only scored 70-something in a win. That's yeah. scary. Harry McKay looked pretty good as well, didn't he? Yeah, but I wouldn't trust him like I wouldn't trust my Scotty Cameron. Yeah, not picking him, just more is there potential that he takes a few points away from Kernow throughout the year if he's... Uh... If he's going to have games call, like that. Like if he gets better, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, like it. Um, yep. Isaac's Heaney's 483,000. Um, Been listening to a few podcasts out there um, around Supercoach because I thought some some of us should have do a little bit of research. Zach Fisher, gone to North Melbourne this year, going to play predominant midfield. What... What's your thoughts there? Is he the little guy from from Carlton? Yeah, he went was at Carlton and he's moved across. Thirty percent owned, and he's only three hundred and seventy eight thousand dollars. That potentially allows us to not only get a, a 
gun midfielder in, but then also potentially upgrade a midfielder as well. I know you well, and I, before we jumped Isaac's, on here... We... Isaac's 3% owned. Yeah, but you're not worried about what you said, though, in relation to the Swans midfield? I am. I am. So you're pushing hard for Zach If Fisher. we're going by own percentages in the forward line, you've got Harley Reid is the most owned at 71%. We've got him. Uh, Darcy Wilson, who's a rookie, will potentially look at him. I think he's already been named that he'll get a game. James Jordan is the next one owned at 49%. Now, obviously, I don't think we can get Heaney and Jordan in because we're already pretty swans heavy in there. How many points did he have? James Jordan had 81 super coach points. He barely got a touch at the start. Yeah, I think, was it four positions to half time? Yeah, it wasn't Mason Cox bad, but it was slow. Yeah. Tell you who's, tell you who's super coach doesn't love enough. Um, Will Hayward was enormous for the Swans on Thursday night. And he's copped 64 points. Uh, 83, I think, with two oh, goals. Yeah, right. Players that are influential for their sides that might do all the little things well sometimes don't get rewarded as well. Little Papa, 120 points, one goal. What a man. Yeah. I mean, he was a lock anyway, but Jesus, that's nice, isn't it? Played right a good game. Let's try your little Zach Fisher play. He goes in. Yep. Um, that leaves us with 622,100 for a midfielder. Yep. Uh, a premium midfielder to, to finish us off. And the app is freezing. No, we start, the available options start from Errol and go down. Caleb Sarong, uh, Lockie Neal. What did Lockie have round one? Lockie had... He had 112 super coach points with 25 disposals. I don't, Lockie, if Lockie Neal was going to be that bloke that racked up 35 to 40 every week, I'd, I'd say just go and get it, you know. But Lyons seems to be playing a bit more of a role in there. Dunkley looks like he's getting back to his best. And then you've got McCluggage, Bailey potentially rolling through there as well. I, I don't know if there's a better option out there. What about Jason Horn Francis from Port? Um, third, maybe fourth year player. Good footy side. Expected to play finals, um, so they're therefore going to win a lot. He might keep a couple of goals. He has upside in a good team, a decent yep. team. Hopefully not too good. Um, I like watching Port play. I don't like seeing him win. Um, they play West Coast first up. He's 5% owned. Um, he's 433000 He's a bit of a, a point of difference. I don't love it. Um, I think we've already got Ollie Wines in there, who's a bit of that potential okay. lower price person. I don't overly like watching him play, but what did you think of Viney in the midfield? Yeah, he looks like he's going to put him on his back. Are we worried about him being injured? Because otherwise, is that potentially somebody who we look to target? Well, what did he score round one? Because he kicked a fluke goal. Yeah, he scored 138 super coach points, kicked two goals and had 30 touches. He had his customary seven tackles. I think we do get a lot of points from him continuously tackling, which is always a good thing. Can we afford Petrarca, or is he just out of our price range? He's 50k out of our price range. Hmm. 55. Errol Goulden is Errol Goulden is dead set, bang on our price range. Yeah. Like it makes us zero. Cap left, which you like. Do we roll with him for one more week and then decide... It is easier to trade down than up. Yep. Right, uh, this is our side as it runs out for actual round one. Come and get some. If you want some, come get some. We will um, take you on and I think we'll beat you. Nick Dacos, captains at the moment in the back line. Hey, Sheasel, H. Young, Jay Gibkiss, Zach Reed. I'm assuming it's Zach because it's Z, Zach, yep. wherever you are, mate. Uh, N. Cofield from the Doggies. Zach Williams and B. Howes on the bench in the back line. In the guts, E. Goulden, T. Green, A. Brayshaw, M. Rowell, C. Warner, J. Steele, O. Wines, R. Sanders, M. Roberts on the bench with J. Ware, and W. Rowland. How'd he go first up? Uh, didn't check. I don't think he played. Uh, the rookies Ooh. will be subject to change to who gets named. Yeah, he'll, he'll be a goner. Um, Max Gorn to bounce back. You know, it's not going to get any tougher than it did for Max on Thursday night going up, up against the number one ruckman in the comp in Brody Grundy, who's a lock in our side all year long. 
uh, S Naismith X Swan. Uh, welcome to the other crowd, C, my man. Big debut again when your side got killed. Well done. Um, T Papley. He might have been captain at 120 points. Big game player. Uh, Zed Fisher. A real Roycey special player. That uh, I hate it, but I love Roycey and I've let him do it. N5. H. Reed, F. McRae, A. Sexton. Uh, and our forward line on the bench is S. Mananana from Geelong and H. Garcia. That's our side, the other Crow FC um, AFL Super Coach, as we embark upon our inaugural season and uh, we expect to be winning. There's still spots in our uh, overall points league as well, league code 748619, if you do want to come and take us on. Uh, there's already 42 people in the league that have already joined. So the head to head league's closed, but the total points league is open. We are head to head operators. Um, but it'll be very interesting to see who does take out the uh, overall points on Supercoach for both the AFL and NRL. Hey, another great episode. I thought I enjoyed it. Just an interesting show, Pratty. We've got a big weekend of Supercoach. Do we stick fat with some of those big, thick boys in rugby league that let us down a little bit over the weekend? I think we will. Make sure you you find us on social media. Saturday morning, full set, quaddies, all ups, staking plan, Melbourne and Sydney. Thursday afternoon, you get the golf, the players. Can one of these blokes find a winner and try and catch me? I doubt it, but they're going to try. You watch every player they tip you. Don't follow them in this week because they're going to be going for like $80 plus players. I'll give you the grouse. That'll be on our socials. J-Mac, Kingsley, Jazzy, Punts. We're all going head to head in the NRL. Bit of a wobbly start from us all. That'll be on our socials too. Uh, Like and subscribe. Have a phenomenal, phenomenal weekend wherever you are. And, uh, yeah, make sure you get around us on the socials and just rip and tear and just sit back and enjoy Friday night because it's going to be a glorious night for the Sydney Swans. All the pop. Bye for now.